So we are back to do one more video, one last time, to get you ready for the pre-calc semester one final. So again, we've got so much to cover that there's no way I can cover everything in a video. But I thought I would give you a few more on tidbits on things we had covered that you will want to remember so that uh, you can keep this in your long-term memory by touching this again one more time. I'm hoping this will help. So say we have two functions, f of x and, I can't write f of x apparently, f of x and g of x. I hope you remember that when you have a function like this, uh, you can get its domain fairly easily. And when you combine functions, we had a big uh, unit on uh, finding the domains when you just have functions that are added or subtracted or uh, multiplied versus domains of functions that are being put inside each other, functions inside of other functions. So let's say I had this one, uh, and this is uh, x plus 5. That's a fairly simple function. I hope that you can find the domain fairly easily. Domain of the f function would be, and the domain of the g function would be. I'm going to pause for a second. I encourage the sub to pause for a second while you uh, see if you can get those domains by yourself. Okay, you may recall that when we have a function that has a square root in it, its domain has to be set so that whatever's underneath the square root right there has to be set greater than or equal to 0. Okay, so x plus 2, sorry, I missed the 2 there, uh, has to be greater than or equal to 0. So I subtract 2 from both sides. I have x is greater than or equal to negative 2. That's my domain, x greater than or equal to negative 2. All right. Also, just an FYI, if there had been a fraction, like if I had made this one 1 over x plus 5, then its domain would have been all reals except x cannot equal whatever makes the bottom 0, which would be like negative 5. Now, I know it wasn't that way, so I'm going to back this up. But I just thought I'd remind you, with fractions, whatever makes the bottom 0 is also something you have to be careful of, and it, all reals except that. Well, in this case, this is also worthy of note because you always start with all reals and then you say what would crash it, but nothing would crash this. So it's just all reals. All right, so the one on the left is all reals except x cannot uh, be, or x has to be, sorry, greater than or equal to negative 2. If you put those on a number line, I think that sometimes helps. Here's a negative 2, and it can't, or no, excuse me, it can be that, and it has to be bigger than that. There we go. Okay, so there's my number line representation of it. Over here, all reals could be like a number line where everything is shaded in. Okay. So if they ask you for uh, the domain for a combined function like f times g or f minus g or f uh, plus g, those are the simple ones. You just take the two functions and do what they say. They say to multiply them like this, multiply them. They say to subtract them, you subtract them or add them. And so let's just do one of them like f plus g. So here's f function, square root of x plus 2, plus the g function, which is x plus 5. And it's, you can just leave it just like that because those can't be combined. All right, so to get the combined functions is very easy. But how about the domains? For the domain, when you have those three situations, you have the two number lines overlapped, as in the, the intersection of the two domains. So here's the domain of f, and here's the domain of g. And wherever they overlap, that's the combined domain. So the domain of f was everything bigger than negative 2, uh, and including negative 2. The domain of g is all reals. So when you overlap anything with all reals, it just overlaps where the other one is. So the answer is, for this one, for all three of these domains, for this, this, or this, the domain would just be back to neg x has to be greater than or equal to negative 2. So it's a number line representation, looks like that. Or you could say, if you wanted interval notation, negative 2 to infinity. Okay, oh wait, bracket on the negative 2. All right. 
Now, here's the hardest two kinds. What if we had an f divided by g domain, f over g? Well, first of all, what is the f function again? It's the square root of x plus 2. What is the g function again? The g function was just x plus 5. So there is my combined function. Now what's its domain? Now this one is a little more complicated because you have to take, when you have a divide here, you have to take the f function's domain, which was bigger than negative 2, and the g function's domain, which was that g had, she had no restrictions, it could be anything. And you need a third number line for this kind. Because when you're dividing two functions, it cannot be allowed that the bottom function would equal zero. Originally, the g function here, wasn't it okay for this thing to be equal to zero? Yeah, it's all right to be zero. There's no fraction involved, and you're not like getting a zero on the bottom of a denominator or something. This is just a situation where g would normally be okay to be zero, but when you put it on the bottom of two functions, it becomes divided by, and that means that we can't allow it to be zero. So this third number line here that you have to overlap is the one that says that g, the domain of g, cannot be zero. All it says is, what would crash this function now that didn't used to crash it? we would not be allowed to let x equal negative 5, okay? So if negative 5 is over here, it can't be that. All right, but it could be everything else. All right, now when you overlap these three domains, where do they all overlap? All three of them have to overlap. Well, this one is really not terribly creative because... It's still, those three all overlap at greater than or equal to negative 2. Now, this could have, if I would have put the empty spot like right in here, it could have made this much more complicated. So, just be aware that if your function, uh, if you're dividing two functions, you would have to check that you can't allow the denominator to be equal to 0 and that means the g function, or the, the lower function, cannot be allowed to be 0. If this had been like 7, uh, and I had made it like x minus 7, then 7 wouldn't be allowed, and therefore it would have only wanted to lap here to here, and there to there. It would have split my domain up into a couple parts. All right, and then the last kind of domain that's the most complicated, and you had one of these on your take-home final, so I know you know this is important, uh, is to do f of g of x and its domain. All right, so if we put one function into the other, here is something I strongly recommend. I really think it's easier for kids to understand this when it looks like this. f of g of x, okay? That's what you're really finding. And then to get its domain, you always start with the inside one. And it's the domain of g intersected with g of x, you use the same function as you were using here, in the domain of the other function. So what would that look like for our last problem there? Well, we had uh, our two domains. Our domain of f was x is greater than or equal to negative 2. So, uh, and our domain of g, here I'm going to pause for a second copy those over. Okay, so I've got them copied over now. So the domain of G, the domain of G is all right here. So it's all reals intersected with G of X, which is this function. It's not a domain. It's the function itself, G of X, which is X plus 5. Having put that in the domain of F, which is right here. So how do I put it into that? I put it in where the x is. And so x plus 5 goes where the x is. x plus 5 is greater than or equal to negative 2. And I'd solve that. So I'm going to subtract 5 from both sides. So x has to be greater than or equal to negative 7. All right. How do I now intersect all reals 
intersected with x is greater than or equal to negative 7. I'm going to put number line with all reals is everything. And the other number line, overlapping them is a great way to intersect them. Um, x is greater than or equal to negative 7. Here's negative 7. Here's greater than or equal to negative 7. And where do those two overlap? Like that. My final answer would be x is greater than greater than or equal to negative 7. That's my domain of f of g of x. So when you have a function in a function, you got to be able to know how to do this. This is always the inside one, and then it's a repeat of the same function, except not at the domain, but the actual function itself. The g function happens twice there, and then it goes into the domain of f, into the domain of the other one. So in this case, it went right in there. All right, so there's a summary of uh, how to find domains when you have functions inside of functions, and that's kind of a, of a critical topic we talked about this semester. Another one is logs. So let's go back to logs again. Uh, just a quick primer on logs. If you had log base 5 of x equals 3, I hope you know how to rewrite. Would everybody please take a moment and rewrite this one? Okay, you should have said 5 to the third, oops, oops, 5 to the third equals x, so x equals 125. All right, that's one of the main things, is if you're stuck in a log problem, be able to rewrite back and forth between these two. So if instead we had started with 5 to the x equals 20, you should be able to rewrite that as a log. And so you'd say log base 5 of, jump to the other side, 20, jump back, equals x. And now look, x is alone. I've solved it. Now, if I had a calculator, but you won't for the final, uh, you'd have to put that in the calculator as log 20 divided by log 5. All right, next topic on logs is when you had logs that were like this, they're the same base, uh, and they were all expanded, let's say it was 5 log x minus uh, 2 log base 3 of 4. Uh, let's make that a 3, just to make it slightly easier, uh, is equal to, uh, let's say, 7. I've got a problem here where I need to be able to condense. Condensing logs was a key. This needs to be condensed down to one log. Why don't you give that a try? I'll pause for a second while you do. Okay, so hopefully you put this 5 back up onto the exponent of this x. So this would be log base 3 of x to the 5th minus that 2 can go up as an exponent on that 3. Log base 3 of 3 squared. And I know some of you are probably thinking, can't you just change that into a number? Yes, I could change that into a number, and the number would be a 2. Okay, uh, And that would be a great way to solve this problem. But... I'm going to show you how you could have condensed this down into one log. All right? I could have condensed this down into one log by saying, well, they both have log base 3 in them, and this is a subtract, so I can change this into log base 3 of x to the fifth, and when there's a subtract involved, you say divided by the other one, which is 3 squared, which is 9. Okay? I'm condensing it down to one log is equal to 7 still. Now, if the goal was to just condense, I condensed it. But now if the goal is to solve, the goal is to get x by itself, then my next step is to do a rewrite. 3 to the 7th is equal to all of this. Okay, so 3 to the 7th is a humongous number, is equal to x to the 5th over 9, and do you get that x is now getting close to by itself? And that's kind of the whole point. So we needed condensing logs for this one to be able to um, get x solved. All right, now from here you just have to multiply by 9 and put everything to the 1 -fifth power and you'd have it. And I know it's a big number, but uh, that's how you'd get x alone for that one. What if you have logs on both sides? Log base 3 of x plus 3 and log base 3 of uh, 4. I hope you know that if the log, there's one log on each side, that's one reason you need to know condensing, is to be able to get it down to just one log on each side. Then, 
this has to equal this. So x plus 3 would have to equal 4. And that's a nice simple equation. So I'm just going to subtract 3 from both sides. x equals 1. Now I'd want to double check to make sure that that, doesn't, that answer doesn't actually turn out to be extraneous. Put it back in, see if it actually crashes the function. All right, so there we go. And another way to think of that is it's sort of like these logs are canceling, but it's not really what's happening. So, all right. Uh, something that's kind of like that is if I have something to a power like this, then I can introduce a log on both sides. Just like I just took logs off of both sides, I can put logs onto both sides. I can say this is log base 5 on both sides. And now, why is that good? Because this x can drop down in front, and then log base 5 of 5 is equal to 1, and then it'd be x times 1, so it'd be x. x is alone on that side. x is equal to log base 5 of 3 to the x plus 4, and now it's still not done. But... The power rule says about this about logs. You can take that and drop it down in the front here. So x is equal to the x plus 4 gets dropped down in front of this other log base 5 of 3. Okay, now, and if I'm trying to get the x's alone, this is a tricky one. I've got x's on both sides. i got to get the x's to be on the same side as each other. So I'm going to multiply this all out. x is equal to x times log base 5 of 3. I'm distributing this out, uh, plus 4 log base 5 of 3. And now again, i got to get the x's to the same side. I'm going to uh, subtract this one from both sides. So minus x log base 5 of 3 from both sides. And now x minus x log base 5 of 3 is equal to 4 log base 5 of 3. Now, is the x alone yet? Nope. But one of my favorite rules comes in. If somebody knows it, say it. I'm hoping they said, if you can factor it, you should. x comes out. I got 1 minus log base 5 of 3 is equal to 4 log base 5 of 3. And now the x is almost alone. Divide both sides to get the x alone by 1 minus log base 5 of 3. 1 minus log base 5 of 3. And now, hey, x is alone. Yay. x is equal to all that. All right, that's about as complicated as you can get with logs. Uh, and we needed to solve this one. Um, by adding logs to both sides. That's a strategy I wanted to bring up there. All right. Uh, next, let's talk about uh, rational and regular functions and their domains and zeros and that kind of stuff. So let's say I had this. Y equals uh, x plus 5 over x minus 7. What if I just asked you what's its domain? All reals except x cannot be 7. Okay, good. So uh, what, though, if I, my question was, what's the x-intercepts? Well, the x-intercepts are where what? Where y equals 0. So if I were going to put a 0 right here, that's a little equation I could solve now. So do you remember how to clear fractions on equations? Somebody in the class, what should I multiply both sides by? x minus 7 is what I'm sure somebody said. And that way you can see, after this cancels this, and 0 times anything makes 0, all it really matters is what would make the top 0. You get what just happened there? After the x minus 7 is canceled on the right. On the left-hand side, we had 0 times x minus 7, which is 0. So it's just what makes the top 0. That's a good lesson in life there. You don't have to go through all of that. The zeros are what makes the top zero. Because if the top is zero, you divide by anything, and you get zero. All right, so the x-intercepts are where y is zero, but they're really just what makes the top of the fraction zero. So x must be negative 5 would be a good uh, x-intercept to know. And then 
The x-intercepts are great, but how about the y-intercepts? The y-intercepts are where? x is 0. So all I have to do then is take my original red function here, and I'm going to rewrite it. It was y equals x plus 5 over x minus 7. And if I want the y-intercepts, the y-intercepts is where x is 0. I stick in a 0 here, I stick in a 0 here, and my y equals 5 over negative 7, so negative 5 sevenths. And if that's a y-intercept, it's where x is 0, so 0 comma negative 5 sevenths. All right, so that's x-intercepts, y-intercepts, uh, domain. What if this rational function was set greater than 0? Okay, so if you're trying to solve one that's greater than 0, well, first of all, it's important to note you want to have it set greater than 0. If it was, like, greater than 1, you wouldn't be able to solve this problem until you got it set greater than 0. So if it were like this, I'd have to subtract 1 from both sides, and then it's equal to 0. Great, but this would need a common denominator, and then I'd be able to go through this process. Okay? So first thought here is make sure it's set greater than 0 or less than 0 to do this kind. Now, I've told you that whenever you have a greater than or less than sign. Think of it as like the end of a number line. And that should remind you, a number line would really help in solving this problem. Okay? So I'm going to make a number line. And the key points on it are whatever makes the function crash, which in this case is a 7, and whatever makes the function on top be 0, or just to be equal 0. The top has to be equal 0. So the zeros for it would be negative 5. So here's a negative 5. Now, those two spots are important. Because if the problem says or equal to 0, then whichever one made it equal 0 would work. But my problem said greater than 0. So even though this is a 0 right here, it's a 0 for the function, that will make it equal 0 here, and that's not greater than 0. So it doesn't work there. How about the 7? It doesn't work there because that crashes the function. Now what you have to do is test all the regions. Test here, test here, test here, and see where it works. And from my experience, this is where kids are pretty terrible. They are not very good at that usually. Uh, and so I strongly encourage you to be really careful on how you test your intervals. So I'm going to put in an 8 and see if it works. Put in an 8 here and an 8 here. Now have I got a true statement? 13 over 8 minus 7 is 1. 13 over 1 is 13. Is 13 bigger than 0? Definitely. It worked. Next, what's between negative 7 or negative 5 and 7? I'm going to test 0. It's one of my favorite numbers to put in because that just makes this 0 and this 0. So it's 5 over negative 7 is negative 5 sevenths. Is that bigger than 0? No, it's not because it's a negative number. So it doesn't work in there. And I'm guessing it's going to work out here, but I'm going to find out by testing negative 6. So, before, I better not do it until I test negative 6. If I put in a negative 6 here and a negative 6 here, I get a negative number divided by a negative number, which makes a positive number, which indeed is bigger than 0. So it does work. Okay, so my final answer here would be from negative infinity to negative 5, it works. Notice I get a range of answers whenever you've got this greater than or less than kind of deal. And that's, let's see here, parentheses around that, because it can't be on either end. Union with from 7 to infinity. All right. Don't think I've made any mistakes in the video so far, so I really want to be careful to not make one at the end here. But uh, last thought is just in general. Strategy on a word problem. All right. So if there's word problems, I have a strong encouragement for you to draw a picture, label the picture as well as you can, and then take the, uh, the information that they want, like if they want to talk about perimeter or area, and you write the pure form of those equations, right? So let's say, for instance, they told you that you wanted to have the base of this triangle be x. That's so far from here to here, it's going to be x. And they wanted the height uh, to be one more than twice the base. In labeling my picture, I hope you could do this. One more than twice the base would be 2x plus 1. Then, if they said the area of the aforementioned triangle would be, uh, let's say, greater than 7, 
then I would first write the pure form of that formula. Area equals length times width. No, actually, sorry, it doesn't for a triangle. Area is base times height, but then you got to divide by 2 or you put a 1 half in front of it. That's the pure form of the area formula for triangle. And if that area is going to be greater than 7, then I would put, here's my area, 1 half base times height, and it's supposed to be equal to area, but I'm going to say it's greater than in my area, which is 7. And now, what is my base? From this picture, you plug things from this picture into said formula. So the x goes in for the base right here, and it's 1 half x times the height is 2x plus 1. And I'll put that in parentheses, and that's important, uh, is greater than 7. And now look at that. All of a sudden, I've got another one of those problems where I've got, I'm going to put this 2 on the bottom so you see, x times 2x plus 1 all over 2 is greater than 7. And this would be one uh, where I would try to find my zeros, find my, uh, let me think, uh, find my things that crash it, but nothing would crash this because you can't make the denominator zero and there's no square roots to worry about. So then it's just the zeros, okay? But now I'd have to put the seven over to the other side and make a common denominator and whew, this would be a tough one. But moral of the story, if it was all said and done, I would find my things that make my equation zero, and I would put them on the number line. And then once I knew what they were, I would test intervals around them to figure out, let's say it worked here and it worked here. And uh, I'm not going to try to finish this one because the numbers are really tough. Moral of story, when you're doing word problems, set up a picture that you label thoroughly. Then start with a pure form of a formula and then put information that you know into the formula. So if I know that my base is really x, then I put in an x right there. And if you know that your height is really 2x plus 1, put it in. And when it's all said and done, you should end with something that uh, we wouldn't have one this tough just because a calculator would have been really handy for solving this one, and we would we would give you something that's doable without a calculator for this honors pre-calc test because the final here does not allow calculators. So, so that's just a general theme of solving word problems is a really important thing that pre-calc students and honors pre-calc students in particular have to be able to handle. So, all right. Uh, at this point, I believe the sub is either has already done this or will hand back those uh, tests that I had given you so you can take a look at uh, the results from your Chapter 9 test. Uh, and hopefully, if there's any mistakes that you see on there, hopefully you can learn a little bit about how to fix that. Uh, those tests have to be handed back in before you leave. I am wishing you the very best of luck on your final. I will be rooting for you. It's easier to grade them when you get a lot right. So make it easier for you and me. Do a great job. All right. Have a wonderful uh, week while I'm gone. I look forward to seeing many of you when I get back to classes here in second semester.